Anyway, uh, good morning and welcome to the Pulse of Miami Church. I think I recognize everybody, so I don't need to introduce myself. Um, but we're, we're going through the book of 1 Samuel. And one of the things that you're going to find in 1 Samuel is you're going to see God working in the lives of, of the characters in, in 1 Samuel. Some, some good stuff, some bad stuff, but you definitely see God interacting in a more active way. And, and what I've been doing over the last few weeks is I've been telling you how God has, has interacted with me and in my life. And as I was driving home last week, I was, I was kind of thinking about how, you know, we talked a few weeks ago, like, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening, like how God speaks. And then I was thinking about uh, last week, how uh, God doesn't need us, but he chooses to work through us. And I, I've been sharing a lot of stories about how God speaks to me and how God works through me. And it reminded me of when I was a, when I was a young uh, person, I, I would say teenage to, to young adult. And I would hear the pastor talk about like how God was like speaking to him and working through his life. And I started thinking to myself, like, how come God is working in his life like that, but he's not working in my life like that? Right. And uh, for a while, I thought, well, maybe there's something wrong with me. Right. Because everybody else seemed to be like everybody else is kind of nodding along like, oh, that that happens in their life, too. But then I started thinking to myself, hey, wait a minute. I wonder if the pastor's full of crap. I wonder if he's just saying all that stuff. And, and everybody else who's just kind of nodding along, I wonder if they feel the same way I do, but they don't want anybody else to feel, you know, you know, know that they feel like I do, so they just kind of nod along. And so the question that I want to ask today is how do we get more God in our lives? Is this thing for real? Is there something that I need to do <clears throat> Or is this whole thing just a show? Have you ever wondered that? Have you ever thought about Christianity and just thought, man, is my whole faith just a show? Or is this thing for real? And it, if it is for real, how do I get God to interact more with me in my life? Now, most Christians and most churches, if you were to sit down and you would say, you know, I got this problem. If you were to be honest with them, Number one, they're going to be really uncomfortable because, you know, uh-oh, an honest person. All right, so, so they're going to be a little uncomfortable with that. But then they're also going to say, okay, well, um, you probably need to study the Bible more. Why don't you join a new Bible study, right? If you just join a new Bible study, then you'll be closer to God. Or if, uh, if you just started memorizing Scripture, I, I can't tell you how many times in the church where I grew up, where I wanted to have more God in my life, and people are like, yeah, just memorize more scripture. Like, obviously. Or uh, back in the 90s, right? Quiet times. Remember when that was like the thing? Quiet time is when you would wake up in the morning and, and you would have a quiet time with just you and God, and you would sit down and read the Bible. I remember so many times people saying, hey, listen, Todd, if you want to have more God in your life, you need to have quiet times or prayer times. But is that really... What allows God to begin to truly work in our lives? Let's open up to 1 Samuel chapter 7 today. 1 Samuel chapter 7. Now, a couple weeks ago, um, it was a test, right? I didn't forget to put the scriptures up on the screen. It was actually a test. No, I'm just kidding. I, I forgot to put the scriptures up on the screen. But I want to encourage you guys to always bring your own Bible. Make sure that you all always have your own uh, Bible app with your phone Follow along. Get used to reading scripture yourself, looking it up yourself. Um, I actually read from the ESV version. So if you wanted to have the one that's directly like mine, you can uh, look that one up. But something that's a, even more fun than that is sometimes when you get a different version, uh, sometimes the pastor will be preaching and you see a, li a little different word and you're like, oh, I think I know something that the pastor don't know. And then you can share it with, uh, after church. So either way, I want you guys to follow along. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 7. Now you remember uh, where we picked up the story. Last week, uh, the, remember the Ark of the Covenant was stolen, captured by the Philistines. And then the Philistines thought that they had, they, they had control over Yahweh, but then 
they, they had a member of their, their god, like uh, their statue of their god, like fell down in front and ke- kind of kept falling in front. And then they started having all kinds of diseases and stuff. And we had a lot of fun with that last week. But they had all these diseases and then they were like, fine, just send it back. So they send it back, right, on a cart. And so all of a sudden the Israelites, they're, they're out there working in the field and here comes the cart with the ark on it. And they get so excited and they go and they're celebrating and then... Some curious guys are like, hey, let's look inside because they didn't take uh, God's presence seriously. And 70 of them died because they were exposed to the to the the potent presence, the holy presence of God. And so that's kind of where where the story has left off. Nobody had taken God seriously. And finally, the, the people of Israel were realizing we need to do something different. And so in 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 1, it says, The men of Kiriath, Jerim, came and took up the ark of Yahweh and brought it to the house of Abinadab on a hill. And they consecrated his son Eleazar to have charge of the ark of Yahweh. So basically they were like, hey, we can't take care of this ark. We need somebody to, that, that really understands how to take care of it. So they, they took it to another city. Uh, they assigned a person to do all the research and you are in charge of making sure that we take God's presence seriously. Verse 2, from the day that the ark was lodged at kiriath Jerim, a long time passed, some 20 years, and all the house of Israel lamented after Yahweh. And so they were, they realized, they finally realized that they had done something wrong, Right? And we're going to see how they act differently in the next few verses. Verse 3, and Samuel, remember Samuel, okay? Eli the priest has died. So Samuel is now the the spiritual leader. Remember for years when he was a little kid, God was speaking through him and people would come up to him and, and, and God would speak through Samuel to the lives of people. And everybody just was like, wow, this kid, you know, is a prophet. So now, now that all, everybody else has died off, well, now he's kind of the spiritual leader. And Samuel said to all the house of Israel, if you are returning to Yahweh with all your heart, then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtaroth from among you and direct your heart to Yahweh and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. Okay. He says, listen, if you want to take, you, you, guys, you guys are saying that you want to take Yahweh seriously, but stop worshiping these other gods. And remember back then, each god had like an area that that god was kind of in charge of. And so, so it was weird because the, the uh, Israelites, they had Yahweh and they came into these other gods area. And so they continue to try to worship these other gods. And then, and then people like Samuel are like, you don't need those other gods. You've got Yahweh. And so then they would start worshiping Yahweh, but then they didn't get what they wanted. And so they were kind of using the other gods as a backup. You know, we never do anything like that, right? Have a backup. And so, and so that, that's what they were doing. They, they were kind of like, yeah, we want to worship Yahweh. But, you know, if it doesn't work out, we've always got Baal over here. And so finally, uh, uh, Samuel was like, Put that stuff away. Get get rid of it. You don't need that stuff. Verse 4, So the people of Israel put away the Baals and the Ashtaroth, and they served Yahweh only. Now we've seen this story over and over again. We've seen it throughout the book of Judges, right? The people would get convicted, they'd put stuff away, and then before you know it, they would be worshiping Baal again. Verse 5, But then Samuel did something different. He said, gather all Israel at Mizpah and I will pray to Yahweh for you. He says, you know what? It's not just enough for us to say, okay, we're going to put away this. Let's get together and let's make a statement to Yahweh together. Let's pray together as a family, as a nation. And so the entire nation of Israel came together in a city called Mizpah, right? What did they do in Mizpah? This is, this is uh, our key verse. Verse 6, this is what they did differently. They gathered at Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before Yahweh and fasted on that day and said there, we have sinned against Yahweh. And Samuel judged the people of Israel at Mizpah. 
So they got some water and they were pouring out water. What, what, what does that mean? Well, in the Old Testament, whenever they would use water in, in a religious uh, ceremony, they were acknowledging that they were dirty and that they needed to be cleansed, right? It was an admission of guilt. And God, I have messed up. Would you please make me clean? And so when they took the water and they're pouring it out, they're recognizing we have done something wrong. We are unclean. They weren't just going, okay, we'll try out Yahweh for a little bit. And if that doesn't work out, we'll go back to Baal. What they were saying is, no, we're wrong. And when they poured out that water, they were pouring out their hearts to God. And you can imagine them crying and saying, God, we have sinned against you. Please forgive us. And it, when it says that Samuel judged the people of Israel, it doesn't mean like he was like, judgment. Like, it's not like that. Uh, that basically means back then, remember the judges, they were kind of the way that Israel would govern itself. And so he became the person governing, the person in charge of Israel. But he was a, a spiritual leader, okay? It wasn't like a king. Verse 7, now when the Philistines, dun, 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 <laughs> these are the bad guys, heard that the people of Israel had gathered at Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the people of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. So the Philistines went, <laughs> right? They're all, the whole nation is in Mizpah, right? They're vulnerable. I heard they're crying and pouring out water. Like this is the perfect time to go attack. They're not ready. And so the Philistines start creeping up, right? And this is a large, I mean, I'm talking, we're talking about thousands upon thousands of soldiers, right? And they're coming up and they're trying to descend upon Mizpah so that they can, they can attack the Israelites when they're not expecting it. And when the, when the Israelites got word, obviously when you got thousands of soldiers over there, somebody's going to see it. So when they finally got word, but it was too late, they were freaking out. I mean, they had, you know, there was men there, but they weren't ready for battle. You know, they were grabbing some swords where they could find them. And so in verse 8 says, And the people of Israel said to Samuel, Do not cease to cry out to Yahweh, our God, for us, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. Now, I'm just going to kind of pause here for a second. Here they finally did something different. All the other times they said, you know what? Yeah, we should, we should, we should just worship Yahweh. This time they, they repented, right? Like they, they were sorry. They, they, were, uh, they were heartbroken for what they had done to Yahweh. And so there was true repentance. But then the attack came. Can I just kind of take a pause from the story to talk about you and me? Whenever we get to a place of repentance, when we say, you know what? I was wrong, God. I'm not going to do things my way. I'm going to do it your way. You know what happens pretty soon after that? An attack comes. Always. I can tell you every time in my life when I said, you know what, God? I'm tired of doing things my way. I'm, I, I'm the one that's wrong. Please forgive me. I'm going to do things. You. Then the, the, the attack comes and then it's like, you know what, God? What? Why am I even trying things your way? Like as soon as I try to do the right thing, I get attacked again. And that's exactly what's happening here. And it's a test and, it, and, it's, and it's a question. Are you going to go back to Baal, right? Are you going to go back to the way that things were before? Are they going to say, uh, never mind, let's take out our asterisk pole. Maybe that'll work, right? Verse 9, so Samuel took a nursing lamb, so a young lamb, offered it as a whole burnt offering to Yahweh. So that would be an offering like a, a, of atonement for their sin. And Yahweh cried out to Yah I'm sorry, and Samuel cried out to Yahweh for Israel and Yahweh answered him. So you've got the Philistines, they're creeping in. They offer a, a, a burnt offering for their sins before Yahweh. What's going to happen? Verse 10. And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to attack Israel. But Yahweh thundered with a mighty sound. Boom! Like, not just a thunder, but like a Krakatoa. Like a boom! Like, like, like an atomic bomb. 
Imagine a, a sound like that going off in the ancient world. Okay? And so as they drew near to attack, Yahweh thundered with a mighty sound that day against the Philistines and threw them into utter confusion. And they were defeated before Israel. Now, how were they defeated? Verse 11, because the men of Israel went out from Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and struck them as far as below Bethkar. The way that I kind of in, in, envision it in my head is that they really weren't ready to fight. So they had to go out in their, in their pajamas, you know, so they're, they're kind of going out there. They're not really prepared, but God protected them. God confused them. The Israelites still had to do fighting. They still had to fight, but God gave them a victory that day. Why? Because they finally came to a place of repentance. In fact, this lasted for a long time. Um, it says in verse 12, Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen and called its name Ebenezer. Remember, uh, is, does anybody remember another Ebenezer that's famous? Ebenezer Scrooge, right? What does Ebenezer mean? It means the stone of help. In the story uh, of Ebenezer Scrooge, I believe he was supposed to help. He was supposed to, supposed to be a stone of help for, for Cratchit and his, and his family. Remember little Timmy, right? And so, uh, so he set up uh, a stone called Ebenezer and he said, till now, Yahweh has helped us. Look at this, guys. If we just worship Yahweh, Yahweh is there for us. Verse 13, so the Philistines were subdued and did not again enter uh, the territory of Israel. And the hand of Yahweh was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. And so all of, of Samuel's ministry, God protected them from Philistines. As long as he was in charge, the Philistines had no control over Israel. Verse 14, the cities that the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel from Ekron to Gath. You guys remember the story last week of, of, of the, the ark? The, the first place that it was at, that was a, an, uh, a Philistine city. But then after that, they tried to send it to Gath and Ekron. Well, those were Philistine cities that they had stolen from the Israelites. And so after they had repented and God gave them that victory at Mizpah, they continued to push them back and they got their territory back. Like they became successful. God was working in their lives. And there was also peace between Israel and the Amorites. So verse 15, Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. Verse 16, and then he went on a circuit year by year to Bethel, Gilgal, and Mizpah, and he judged Israel in all these places. Now, um, I'm just going to kind of give you a a warning that that's going to become a problem. And we're going to talk about how ministry and how working and sometimes doing, the, doing good things can end up affecting your family in a negative way. And we're going to talk about that with, with him next week. Verse 17, then he would return to Ramah for his home was there. And there he also judged Israel and he built an altar there to Yahweh. And so here's Samuel, he's serving, he's serving Yahweh and he's getting the people and they repented. And finally, when they repented, things changed. And so if, I, if we're going to ask the question, how do I get more God in my life? The answer is very simple. It's repent. Okay, in fact, I wanted to make it really simple. It was just a one word answer. Repent. Wow, Todd, that seems pretty simple. Well, it's a simple concept, but it's hard to do. Right, because repentance means admitting that you were wrong. And I don't know about you guys, but I got a huge, I have a hard time admitting when I'm wrong. And I think that's one of the reasons why repenting is so, let, let me explain to you what repenting is. Repenting means, um, literally, I'm going this way, and then I decide that I'm going to go in the opposite direction. The problem with repentance is that we think that repentance is a physical thing, okay? Oh, I was doing this, and then I decided I didn't want to do it anymore, so I did this. But repentance actually begins in the heart, right? So for instance, let's say that there's something that you don't want to do anymore. Let's say that you have an addiction to cursing, and you're just like, you know what, I don't want to curse anymore. 
or uh, I have an addiction to looking at stuff on the internet that I shouldn't be listening, uh, I shouldn't be looking at, right? The problem is, is that we think repentance means, okay, I'm not going to do it anymore. But actually where repentance starts is by coming before the Lord and pouring out your heart before God and saying, God, I have sinned before you. God, my heart is so dirty. God, I don't, I don't want to do that anymore. Lord, change my heart. Because here's the problem. If you just change the behavior without changing the heart, eventually you're going to go right back to where it was before because you never changed the heart. But if we come before the Lord with broken hearts and allow God to change our hearts, eventually you get to a place where it's like, I don't even feel like cursing anymore. I don't even like that. Or I don't even feel like looking at, at that stuff on the internet. It just makes me feel all gross. Like, I, I hate that stuff. That's how you repent. It, it's it's, it's your, your mind, your soul, your emotions, everything changing. I had a, I, I was having a discussion with uh, this guy that I know and we were actually texting back and forth and we were actually kind of talking about some pretty deep stuff. But then as we were talking about it, he actually uh, accused me of saying something that I didn't say. And so I said, hey, uh, you said that I said something and um, I, think, I think you need to, to acknowledge that you're wrong and that you need to apologize to me. And so he just kind of like ignored it and like continued to try his argument. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I need you to go back and we need to acknowledge that you were wrong. And he kept, he had such a problem. Like, like I'm telling you, like back and forth. And I'm like, I'm not going to continue to have this conversation until you finally. And he goes, why is this so important to you? And I said, if you're not willing to admit when you were, if we're not willing to admit when we're wrong with the little stuff, Right. You and I are trying to have this conversation about these great truths. But how can I trust that if, if, if truth slapped you in the face, that you wouldn't just kind of ignore it because you were so worried about being wrong? If we're, if we're not faithful in the little things, if we can't be truthful with the little things and say, man, I'm wrong here, how are we ever going to, to admit that we were wrong about bigger things? And that's, that's why God wants you to repent. Even about little stuff. Because if you can't do it about the little stuff, how are you ever going to change your life for the big stuff? You know, um, I keep sharing how God works in my life. And um, it could be that the pastor's full of crap. Right? Right? Or it could be that God is trying to work in your life. Here's what I don't want you to do. I don't want you to get into doing something different and thinking that that's going to make the, the, the difference. I don't want you to get into doing. I want you to get into being. Does that make sense? Like, I, I don't want you to just start, okay, well, I need to, I need to memorize more scripture. And here's, here's the thing, like, I'm, I'm your pastor. I want you to memorize scripture. Like, I do a scripture memorization at the end. But here's what I'm going to tell you. I've known so many people in my life that got into Bible studies and memorized scripture, but they never allowed it to affect their heart. And they were jerks. They knew a lot of scriptures, but they were jerks. Right? If you can know all the scripture in the world, but if you never let it get here, that's the problem. Right? And unless we repent, then we're never going to truly experience what God wants to do in our life. You know, some people feel like they need to confess. Listen, um, if, you feel, if you've got some deep, dark, I mean, if you want to talk about something, I'll talk about it. But you don't have to come and talk to me. Like, people think I'm a Catholic priest. I don't have a booth, right? I don't need to know your deepest, darkest, you know, things that you need to repent of. And here's the truth of the matter. I'm dealing with my own stuff, all right? I'm, there's stuff that I continue to hold on to, and, and, and I'm dealing with my stuff. So I don't want you guys to think that, oh, I, you know, I'm going to come to him because he's so hot. I'm not. It's just a matter of saying, okay, God, whatever you show me, I'm willing. It's not about prayer times and, and quiet times, although I would love for you to do those things. 
But can I make a confession to you guys right now? I, I don't, I don't, I used to, and I'm not saying that it's bad to do it, but I used to get up in the morning and get on my knees and, and I used to pray. But, but you know how I pray today? It's just like as I'm walking through life, I'm just praying all the time. It's like a conversation that just never ends. I, I, don't, I don't have to get into a quiet time. I, I'll be driving from one place to another and I'll just start praying for you guys. Or for, you know, the quarterback of the Dolphins or, you know, what? I just, just talking to him. I'm talk, sometimes I'm talking to God while I'm talking to you. Like we're having a conversation and I'm just saying, God, give me the, the next words to say. Or sometimes I'm like, God, please get me out of this conversation. You know what I mean? So it, <laughs> it could be any of those, right? But that's, that's how I converse with God. So, so here's what, I don't want you to focus on anything. I just want you to get to a place where you go, God, I want you to have my heart. Because that's the way that God will begin to move in your life. Matthew 23, 12 is something that Jesus uh, said, and, and I'd like for us to memorize that. So read it with me today. Ready? For those who exalt themselves will be humble, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. If we would just let go and be humble, then God would do amazing things in our lives. So here's what I want to do. I want to close out our service a little bit differently. I want everybody to close your eyes bow your head, nobody looking around. And I want to ask you, because I believe that everybody in here, I'm looking around, I'm pretty confident that everybody in here has said yes to Jesus. Here's what I want you to do today. I want you to say, God, what is the area of my life that I'm holding on? What is the area of my life that I need to have a broken heart about? Not to just say, I'm not going to do this anymore. But, but Lord, break my heart for that area of my life. Lord, I, I pray that I would be disgusted about sin in my life. Lord, I pray that I would be heartbroken when you tell me to do something and I don't do it. Lord, I just want to be yours today. I don't want it to be a, a, a mind thing. I want it to be a heart thing first. So Lord, I just pray that you'd break my heart, work in my life, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.